So, hi everybody. Welcome back to uh, to Deep Rob. It's the first week still. Um, so, hopefully, uh, your first week is kind of going well. The weather's actually been relatively warm for what's typical in early January here in Michigan. So, we're actually lucky that it's only like 40 degrees or whatever outside. Um, so for today's discussion, uh, the topic is going to be really kind of an intro to Python, PyTorch, and Google Colab. In particular, what I want to show in this, the real kind of core of this uh, discussion is going to be just introducing you on how you can get started on Project Zero. So I'll show, kind of go over the instructions for Project Zero, show how you can download the files, get them uploaded to Google Colab, and then start developing. Um, and so before getting started, um, let me first just see if, if, does anybody have any questions so far about uh, the course, uh, access to resources, um, any, any questions or concerns coming up so far? Okay. Feel free to stop me as things go along if, uh, if anything uh, comes up. Um, yeah, so once again, so today's agenda. So I'll go over just a couple of uh, administrative announcements and then introduce you to Project Zero, uh, go over like a demo on how you can do development in this Google Colab development environment, and then um, I'm anticipating that there might be some troubleshooting things we might have to do uh, in terms of like people accessing the auto grader or maybe their Google Drive things. So I'll kind of go around and uh, towards the end of uh, the discussion and sort of just help as people are, need, are needing help. And the plan for sort of discussions going forward is it's going to kind of be oriented in this similar fashion. So it'll be more tutorial oriented than slide oriented. Don't have that many slides. Uh, lecture is going to be the slide content. Um, but for the slides that I do have, so the first thing, so just a quick note on enrollment. Um, so, and I'll keep an eye also on the chat for those of you on Zoom. Um, so we have uh, additional class permissions are currently in the process of kind of going out. So I think sometime this weekend or maybe on Monday, um, if you're on the wait list, there's, you know, you might um, be getting issued an enrollment. And that applies to both the 400 level section and the 500 level section. So if you don't receive a class permission by next Tuesday, um, and you're still wanting to take the course, uh, contact me and, and Professor Jenkins. So either after lecture, come up and let us know, or um, by email, potentially. Okay, so the other thing I just want to mention, so we have like, uh, like a good number of people have joined, but just want to mention one more time, if you want to join the, the discussion forum for like question and answer, there's a, this opt-in Google form, so just fill that out and then we'll add you to the, to the forum. Um, so this is where we can, you can ask questions about the projects or resources, lectures. Uh, the only kind of hard rules are no discussion of the quizzes, which will come up starting week three, uh, and any verbatim code, like copy and pasting your code from solutions, uh, has to be done as a private post. Um, okay, so those are the only announcements for today. So getting into project zero. Um, so this project is really just uh, kind of like orienting everyone with Python and PyTorch. Um, so we're going to be using PyTorch pretty extensively for all of the remaining uh, projects in this class. And so this first project zero is just to make sure everybody is comfortable working with it. Um, if anyone finds that they're sort of struggling, then we can sort of identify that and figure out um, some resources to help with that. Um, so this is a lighter, this will be a lighter project in comparison to one through, through the final project. Um, so the in terms of what you will actually be implementing, um, it's essentially just a, a collection of um, relatively small uh, functions that we're going to sort of that we describe in text what we would like them to do, and then you'll implement them uh, with PyTorch tensor objects. And so tensors are multi-dimensional arrays uh, of of numerical data that are really the core of PyTorch. So they're highly optimized within PyTorch to do matrix multiplication, matrix addition, all sorts of matrix operations. Um, and to a large extent, the, the uh, tensor objects are what are going to be powering all of the neural networks that will follow in this course um, and make them efficient to run. So in terms of logistics, so the project was released uh, like a, on early Thursday morning. Um, so the instructions and the code are all available on the website. So deeprob.org slash project slash project zero. Um, we'll look at that coming up. Um, so like I was mentioning, so there's going to be using Python, PyTorch, Google Colab, and it's going to be due uh, January 12th, so uh, this, like the evening of our Thursday lecture this next week. Uh, so looking at the instructions, so here I'll break out of uh, Zoom. So if you go to the project web page and go to projects and then project zero, so you'll see the, 
the instructions for this project. So I'll make this bigger. Um, so the it's it's this page is meant to kind of describe step by step what uh, what you would need to do to start implementing this project, and we'll essentially go through the first f sort of four to five steps uh, today during the discussion, just so that everybody can get started with the project. Um, so the first thing that that you'll do is you'll download this zip file that has all the starter code that you need. Um, so you just click the link uh, right there. This will download a zip file for you. Um, so on Mac, the zip files automatically get um, decompressed. So feel free to like follow step by step. And if you run into issues, like if then feel free to uh, it's like raise your hand or, or ask a question. So so the first step, what that's going to do is it's going to give you this set of of uh, files here, which you can see. So we'll have one PyTorch 101. Uh, oh, wait. I didn't realize this laptop was on. Uh, so we have a, this PyTorch 101 uh, Jupyter Notebook file, so this .ipynb file. Uh, PyTorch 101.py, uh, which is a Python script file. And then we have some helper functions, uh, which you don't need to implement anything in in this Rob 599 directory. So once you have the starter code, the next step is to go to your Google Drive and you'll upload the, the source code to Google Drive. And so the reason that we're doing this is that we're gonna be developing in what's called a um, Google Colab envi environment. So just as like a brief introduction. So for all the projects zero through four, uh, we're gonna be using Google Colab. So this is a cloud computing service from Google. Um, it's a, it requires really minimal setup to, to use, so essentially within Google server farms, there's a virtual machine that'll be running, and when you upload your code, that code then will exist on the virtual machine, and you can execute it in real time, and then visualize results over the web in your browser. Um, and so one of the reasons why this is used a lot within the deep learning community is that Google provides like a large amount of GPU resources that to some extent are free. So for our class, we're actually gonna be using uh, the GPU, GPU resources that they provide for free, um, and uh, and so it's a very nice resource for us to use. So you'll see, you'll start to get used to it. But essentially, if you've worked with Jupyter notebooks in the past, it works just the same way as your local copy of a Jupyter notebook would work. So let me pause for a second. Up to this point, uh, any questions so far on like accessing the project files, getting to the website, any? Anything coming up so far? Okay. So, so as a like with a umich.edu account, you have a like a Google account associated with that. You should be familiar with that from your email. So if you go to drive.google.com, you'll have your your Google Drive. So here I just have an empty folder within my Google Drive, which is where I'll put my my project files for this uh, for this demonstration. So. What you can do to, to actually set up your Google Colab environment is as simple, really, as just uploading that starter code. So what I was doing there is just dragging and dropping the files that I downloaded in this Project Zero directory um, to my drive. I'll make it a little bit bigger. And at that point, what you can do is you can access the, the source code by simply opening the directory and then opening the PyTorch 101 Jupyter Notebook file. So if you double click on that file, it'll open up a Colab development environment for you. And so you, that's when you should see um, a, a page that looks just like this. All right. Everybody following along? Have people gotten to the, to the Google Colab environment so far? I'm seeing some nods. OK. All right, so yeah, so, so so has anyone here never worked with Jupyter Notebooks? I'm curious. It's very, it's very plausible if you're not familiar with like Python or Notebooks. Yeah, so a few people. So, so just as a brief kind of uh, introduction to, to what Notebooks are. So they're, um, they're essentially what it really is is sort of a, it's a JSON object. So this, this, this .ipy.nb file is a, you can think of it like a JSON object internally. But what it does is it stores what are called cells. So within this file, you have this collection of cells. And these cells can take on different forms. So they can be code, so they can be Python code, they can be other scripting languages code, or they can be markdown. So markdown is typically what you see in, used in documentation for, for many um, software projects. 
And so this, this whole file collectively is a mixture of documentation and then Python code. And the reason that it's very nice for us is it allows us to visualize output that would be produced from a Python script without having to set up uh, like an actual Python um, interpreter and having to then worry about like using some program outside of a, of a GUI to visualize data from Python. So that'll make more sense kind of as we go along. But the way to actually interact with our code or with the documentation here is you can do a few things. So one option you can do is when you have a cell, you can press shift enter on your keyboard and that will do what's called running the cell. So if it's a documentation cell, all that does is just move your kind of cursor, like it moves the highlighted cell down one. But if you get to a, to a, to a code cell, for example, this code here, which is Python, uh, actually, yeah, this is, this is Python code, uh, then it'll actually execute the code for you. Um, Okay, so at a high level, that's, uh, that's how you can actually like interact with the code. So you can press shift enter, or alternatively, there are also, uh, let me see, some, some commands that you can use here, for example. So you can explicitly like ask to run all of the cells, or you could run all the cells up to the current cell that you're, that you're highlighted on. Um, you could run the specific cell. Um, and so that's how you're gonna interact with your, um, with the Python code that we provide in these notebook files. And so within these projects zero through four, what you'll see is these two types of files. So you have these notebook files, which is where we'll visualize the results from our code. And so in these files, you don't actually have to write any new code. Everything that we provide here, all of this scaffolding is set up so that you can execute and kind of follow linearly through the project with instructions, but you don't actually have to modify anything here. Instead, where your code is gonna to go to actually complete the project is in the, the separate Python file or files, in some cases, that are accompanying um, the notebook. So in this project, we have this one file, pytorch101.py. There are two ways that you can edit it. The recommended way is, so I'll show you in a second. So, so there's two ways. One way you could do it if you'd like to have a separate window is you can open the Python file with a text editor. So there's a built-in text editor within Google Drive, which we can use. And what that'll do is it'll just display this Python file just as a raw text file. So what you can do is you can make changes in the raw text file. You can save them um, the same way, you know, just command S. And those changes will, will propagate to your notebook uh, in, in real time. So that's one approach if you want to, to, to have sort of like two separate windows open. You can visualize both your um, you know, your code in one window and your notebook in the other, and you can sort of edit your, ver your implementations on the left and then sort of run the resulting uh, notebook cells on the right. That's one approach. The other approach that you can use is to do the following. So this first cell that we were running here within the setup code, I'll just describe kind of why it is we have this, this setup code, which you'll see throughout the upcoming projects as well. The first one is this extension auto reload. It's a really useful tool for, for notebooks in that it sets up essentially a, kind, of like a, kind of like a watch command. So it can detect when the Python files that you're gonna be working with, the Python packages, when they change. So when you sort of add a new feature to the Python file, and it'll automatically then reload that file anytime you're using uh, functions that have been changed on the, on the notebook side. So you don't have to like restart your notebook server every time you make a new change in your Python file. So it just makes development much smoother. That's what this first cell does. So you run that. The second then setup cell that we have is the um, mounting your Google Drive to with this notebook, with this particular, um, yeah, with this notebook. So what that does is it then gives access to the, uh, to the files that are in your Google Drive to this particular notebook. So the reason we need that is so that we can access in this notebook this Python file where your implementation is going. Um, so once you've mounted your Google Drive, it'll ask you to sign in just so that it's, because it's your Google Drive account. And at that point then what you can do is you can actually access the, uh, the files for this project. So once this is run, so you can see it's still running, we'll do a sort of check to make sure that our uh, files are accessible. So in this next cell down here where we have Python uh, code, what this is doing is it's just going to print out, so this print 
os.lister is going to just print out all the files that exist within the directory of our project. So the one kind of important piece of detail and the thing it's kind of easy to miss uh, is this path variable that we have that we've asked you to set here is just the location to the project directory. So where you uploaded your files, uh, you should find that directory within, uh, within your Google Drive and just paste that here. So in, in my case, because I was operating within my drive and then this Rob 599 directory, what I would enter is just the Rob 599 directory. So once you've done that and you run the cell, what you'll see is, oh, sorry, one small change. So it should be Rob 599 and then the project the actual name of the project directory, so P0. And once you've done that, you can see that our code now has access to the, to the Python file that we are gonna be implementing our, our project in. All right, so I'll pause again and see if anybody has questions so far or have hit any issues with like mounting their drive or running cells in the notebook. Don't see anything online either. Okay, so at that point then, there's a few other setup, um, there's just like, I guess, one other setup cell here, which is just showing you how you can um, actually now import the, the file where your implementations are gonna go. So, so this particular cell, so we're, we're importing this hello function from the PyTorch 101 uh, file, and so here you can see the hello function is written, and all it should do is print out hello from PyTorch 101, and you can see that's exactly what happens once we've called that Python, that Python function. Um, and so that gives you a sense of how, of how at least this setup code is allowing us to run uh, functions from the Python script in this, in this Jupyter notebook. So the one other thing then I'll point out is now that we've actually mounted our drive, so once you've actually run this cell, if you would prefer to just work out of one browser window, one thing you can do is you can click this File Explorer tab right on the left-hand side. And then you can find the Python file where your implementations are gonna go. So for me, it's within my drive and then the Rob 599 folder, and then the Project Zero and PyTorch 101. So if you double-click that now, you can see it's showing up right here. So now what you can do is you can edit your implementation side-by-side -side with your notebook. Um, so I'll make this bigger. And it's just a slightly more streamlined um, way to, to develop. So now every change that you make in this file will propagate uh, in, in the notebook. So for example, let's say that we wanted to change this, uh, this hello function to say like hello from PyTorch 101 and discussion one. So what we can do is I can make this change here. I'll do command S to save the file. And then if I rerun, this uh, cell down here, what we should see is our chain should propagate. So the output now that our hello function should print should actually change. And so you can see now that we run it, it's added that hello from PyTorch 101 and discussion one. Um, and so this is a, a nice way to kind of develop side by side the, the code that you need to change, which are these stencil, uh, these stencil sections highlighted with the, the comments on the right hand side of the PyTorch 101.py. Um, along with the output then that you'll use to sort of check your implementation and make sure that it's working. All right, I'm gonna take a sip of water. Okay, so any questions so far? Everyone's very quiet. It is Friday, late on Friday. Okay, so yeah, so, um, so, with, so once you've kind of gone through that setup code, now you're actually all set to start working on your, on your project implementation. So the first section of the notebook, there's a short introduction on Python, uh, this, like just as a scripting language. If you're looking for more resources on Python, on Python uh, the, the class that, this, that our class is built on, so Stanford CS231, has a pure Python intro that goes pretty extensively. So I would say if you, if you start working through some of these first uh, cells of, of the Python code and you're feeling like a little bit unfamiliar with Python, then feel free to like dig deeper into those other tutorials or like come to office hours and we can go into more, um, like I'm happy to kind of cover some 
basics on Python. We are assuming in this class you have some experience with, with programming languages. So if you've worked with C++ or if, you, if you've worked with MATLAB before but not Python, Python should be pretty easy to, to pick up. Um, but again, we're happy to work with you and, and try and figure out other resources if that's needed. Um, so in, these first, kind of, in this first kind of introduction section of the notebook, the Python uh, the, and the Python section, you don't have to make any changes here. So there's no required um, changes to these, to these cells. So the first ones are just gonna kind of be going through like basic, how, do you, how it is that we can generate some output, like text output to like standard output, which is the print function, how we can do simple like arithmetic in Python, um, and then one really useful tool is the range function. So for for loops and while loops, uh, or not, not while loops, but for for loops, the range function is very useful. Um, and then at that point, once you've gone through those, just those initial few cells of Python introduction, then we get to the section of code where you'll actually start making changes for the required features that will be graded for the project. Um, so this is now all working in PyTorch. And so, PyTorch is a, is, yeah, so it's an open source machine learning framework. Um, it was first developed by, uh, by Facebook, but since then it's grown and it's a very, very large uh, open source community now that's dedicated really to implementing, at its core, these tensor objects and optimizing matrix operations on tensor objects. So these are multi-dimensional arrays. So you can think about them, yeah, as, as we say here, it's similar to a NumPy array. Um, the difference is that the, the tensor is more optimized for GPU acceleration, and also it's more oriented towards machine learning, whereas NumPy is more like a generic, like numerical, um, uh, like arithmetic library. Um, in addition to that, what PyTorch has built into it, which makes it truly useful for, for deep learning, is it has automatic differentiation. So for training neural networks, what we're gonna look at in, the, in a few weeks, it's probably gonna be, I think, two, two more weeks until we see this, is um, what's called the back propagation algorithm. And so all the training that we're gonna see in this class for how neural networks can learn from data is based on uh, the automatic differentiation and the back propagation algorithm, which PyTorch has built into it. Um, and so those two core features, tensor objects that are accelerated on a GPU, as well as this back propagation algorithm, which, which can efficiently train these uh, neural networks, those are, I would say, really the two kind of core aspects of PyTorch that have made it really successful with, for, for deep learning. And so in this introduction project, or in this kind of PyTorch intro project here, what you're kind of getting your, um, your hands on is just how to sort of do some, some basic manipulations of these tensor objects, and also some really useful, um, like some, some really useful skills of like how to index into tensors or how to use one tensor as an index into a second tensor. These are all things that you see a lot when you start like looking at open source implementations of deep learning papers. You'll see some pretty complex indexing operations. You'll see some pretty complex manipulations of, of tensor objects. So starting to get your hands uh, kind of familiar with how to work with these is a, is a good skill to start picking up. Um, so in these first cells here, the way that, that, it'll work, that you'll sort of work through it is we'd recommend, so sort of read the, the text description that we have, which is just describing the operations that then you'll see in the code. And so these code cells are gonna operate, are gonna, uh, sorry, alternate between some cells where you don't have to make any changes. So those are just to kind of give you a sense of what the expected performance of a particular operation is. So in this cell, for example, we're creating just a, a one-dimensional tensor, this, this tensor A, which has values one, two, and three in it. Um, and then we're just printing out some various properties of that, of that object. So we're printing out, for example, like what's the type of A? Well, it's, a, it's within the class of torch.tensor. What's the dimension of A, right, and so forth. So in this cell, for example, you don't have to make any changes. It's really just to sort of highlight some of the features that are built into these tensor objects that you can use. Um, and then once you work down a little bit further, what we'll highlight then are sections where it's your turn to then actually implement a requested feature. Um, so in this cell, for example, what we're saying all right, is, all right, so it's your turn now in the file, pytorch101.py, complete the implementation for this create sample tensor function, um, the mutate tensor function, and the count tensor elements. So what you'll do is you'll find the corresponding functions that we're referring to on the um, Python script file, read through the text description of what we're asking for this function to actually, to actually do. So we're gonna describe um, in some cases, it'll have an argument, what the argument is and what the return value is expected to be. And then where we have this pass statement within the comment, 
that's where you should add your implementation. And so these functions where you're adding your implementation is what we'll be checking uh, on the autograder side for completion of the, of the project. All right, I'll pause again. Um, any questions, any uh, concerns so far about PyTorch? Pretty explanatory so far? Yeah. Some of them, I think, if I think just take the um, one example, it's called what's the Oh, it's called mutate tensor, mm -hmm. and the one input is uh, one parameter is, is indices, the other is values. Mm -hmm. So, do I need to check if the, the length of indices and values are the same? Good question. So, so the question is like, do we should when you implement these functions, should you be adding like assert statements and other like good coding practices that you might see for like expecting the specific size of a tensor? if a particular function would expect a specific size. Um, so we're not gonna be checking for that um, on the autograder side, so we'll always give your functions correct inputs. We're not gonna be like trying to find like edge cases in like the sizes of the tensors that would potentially trip up your implementation in that way. Um, having said that, it's a great practice to get yourself into and a habit to get yourself into because it, that's a good way to find bugs before they really become just like buried in in like very hard to understand code. Yeah. All right. So, so let me just ask this. So, like, does the does the sort of setup of how the these projects will get developed is that um, does that sort of make sense? So, how you have like the notebook on one hand, the code that you'll actually add your implementations to on the other hand, and you can in, kind of go back and forth between the two and see the output change. Yeah, that's it. that's that's making sense. Okay. So what we'll do now is we'll go through um, and we'll sort of, we'll look at one of these functions and actually like implement it together. Um, but before I do that, what I want to kind of highlight is the, is the autograder and how you can use the, the autograder for getting feedback. So, I mean, on the topic of like good coding practices, I mean, another good, really good coding practice, which hopefully you're, you've picked up in some of your other programming classes, is to do unit testing locally. So I would strongly recommend as you develop I mean, this project, uh, you could do it here, but also in the future projects, it's a good habit to test your functions um, like on a function by function basis. But um, another way to get feedback in these course projects is to use the, the auto grader. So within the, within, the program in, uh, within the project instructions, if you scroll down towards, I think it's, so like number four, we have this link directly to the, the auto grader for this assignment. So what you should see when you log in is it'll ask you to sign in. Um, so once you sign in with your UMich account, you'll be taken to a page that looks like this. So I'll make it maybe a little bit bigger. Um, so this is the where you'll submit your files for, for grading and also for intermediate feedback. Uh, and in particular, this is the, the auto grader for project zero. So in the future, there'll be a separate auto grader. You'll see like this appear will change to project one and, and so forth. Um, so you can see the, the due date for this, for this assignment, so January 12th at midnight. Um, you can see how much time is left from the current time. And then in addition, what you have is the, the number of submissions that you've used so far for today. So we limit you to up to two submissions per day per 24-hour period. And also the number of uh, late-day tokens you have. So the, the way that the late-day tokens work is um, essentially if you submit a project after the, the deadline, you have like a 24 hour period to use one token and then they kind of automatically go down. Um, so in terms of then how you would submit it, all you have to do is drag and drop the files that you edit here. So I'll show you what that looks like. Um, so in this case, we haven't actually implemented anything. And so if you look at like what files it, it's expecting you to submit, it's gonna be just the notebook file and the Python file where your implementation goes. So you don't have to submit the helper functions that we, that we provide. So what you can do is you can go to, the, to your implementation, let's say that 
Um, let's say that we had implemented something here that we wanted to test. So you upload those two files. You'll see that they've been uploaded. You sign your unique name to acknowledge the honor code with the submission, so you haven't given or received um, like unrecognized um, help in this project. And then you can submit those files for, for grading. And so once you've submitted them, what you'll see is a page like this. So this is showing like past uh, performance. So you can see like as I was developing the unit test for this case, the grade was changing for my, on my end. But, but for, for the current submission that we're highlighted on right now, you can see it's actually, it's going to be queued. So it hasn't run yet, but if you refresh the page, okay, it's starting to be run. Um, and so the output that you'll expect to see is gonna look like this. So this page will kind of update as new tests get run. Um, so for each of the particular features that we're asking you to implement, you'll see a separate um, test that's being run. So it'll give you, in this case, because I haven't implemented any of them, like it, it's failing all the test cases so far, and then a corresponding score that goes along with, with each test. So once all of the tests have run, it'll update the score that's shown for this particular submission up on the like upper left. Um, and your final grade will be based on your highest scoring submission. Um, so it won't be the last submission you do at the deadline, it'll be your highest scored over all of your submissions. Um, so given that, that this is uh, what the autograder looks like, I don't like seeing all this red. So let's implement one of the functions together and see um, like what you can kind of expect to, the autograder to do once you've started working on the project. Oh, question, yeah. Yes, all the tests are gonna be public. Public in the sense that you're getting feedback on all the tests. So we don't have like 10 tests hidden that will run after the fact. Having said that, you don't get output uh, from, from the test cases. So if you fail a test, you should only see this. You won't see like standard output. You're not gonna see like, like a, any errors or like what, like a backtrace from what line is erring, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So like you're saying if you click this link, you don't see this. Interesting. What about if you click, I'm curious, yeah, this is good to know. What if you click this? That doesn't work either. Oh, but it lets you submit, right? It should let you submit to the project. That's right. That's not, a, that's not an issue. So what, um, yeah, so. Once the enrollment's settled, I'll, I'll go ahead and add everyone to the roster. Right now I haven't added students to the roster, but what we have done is you can still submit to the autograder and your submissions are being tracked. So don't worry that you can't get to the, to the class directory because you can, like the project is published and you can submit with your unique name uh, to, to, to Project Zero. So yeah, that's good to know. I appreciate you letting me know, but don't worry about it for now. Other other auto grader questions or or concerns? I've seen a number of people have started submitting, so that's good to see. Um, okay, so with that, so let's try implementing one of these functions together. So let's start with the with the first function here. So, uh, so let's see, back to where we were in the cell. So we were here. So it's our turn to implement, let's say, create sample tensor first. So one thing we can try doing right at the very start before we implement anything is we can try running it and you'll see that it's trying to access, it's assuming that our function's gonna output a tensor and it, and it doesn't because we haven't implemented it. So if we look now at this create sample tensor, it's asking us to return a torch tensor of shape three comma two, so it's a two dimensional tensor, uh, which is filled with zeros except for element at uh, index zero along the first dimension, one along the second dimension. So all tensors are zero index. Um, so to get the very first element along a dimension, you would use zero, not one. Um, so it's asking us to set that particular element to 10 and then another element at one comma zero to 100. So, so starting out, so we're gonna go within the portion of the code where it where it's, has this pass statement. We're gonna return the value x. So we're gonna set the tensor that it's asking us to create to, to be the variable that's named X. And what we can do to create this tensor is we can first set up, let's say, um, 
So there's, there's, there's a few ways you could do this. One helper that's really useful and is talked about in the notebook is there's a helper function built into to PyTorch, which is this function torch.zeros. So this will return um, a torch tensor of an arbitrary shape, which we can specify, that's completely filled with all zeros. So in this case, the shape that we want is, is described to be three comma two. And then it's asking us to set the element at position zero, one to the value of 10. So what we can do is we can index into our tensor using bracket notation. So we're gonna set, uh, so within the bracket, we're saying x at position zero along the first dimension and one along the second dimension. So that's giving us access to that portion of the memory. And then by assigning it to the value of 10, we're gonna insert the data of 10 into that, into that portion of the tensor. And we can do the same thing for the second element, but we can change the indexing that we were gonna use to be one comma zero. And we'll set that to be 100, which is what it asks for in the, um, in the definition of the function. So once we've done that, so we can save this Python script. A parentheses? Uh, I might be misremembering it off the top of my head. We can try without, let's see. There we go, thanks for correcting me. So, okay, so now what you can see happens, so within this code block, so the first thing it's doing is it's importing all these functions. So all the, all the functions exist, we've defined them, they're just mostly empty. The first one that it's calling is this create sample tensors and then it's printing out that sample tensor as the first output. So there you can see is the, is the output that it's producing, um, which, is a, which is what we would expect, right? So at the, so, z, so the way to read these tensors if, uh, is for two dimensional tensors, the first dimension is the rows and the second dimension is the columns. So we have, you can see in this tensor here, three rows which is what it asked for, and two columns. So like one column, two columns on the, like, yeah. Um, so it, it appears to us that it's actually printing out the, the, correct, uh, the correct values, like visually we can expect, inspect that and see. Um, so let's say that we, we implemented this function, let's say we implemented maybe like another 15, and we wanted to then check and see whether our intermediate work was correct. So what you can do is, there's sort of two options. One thing you can do is from your drive, you can just directly download these two files and then submit them to the autograder. The other thing you can do is we, there's a helper function that's implemented for you, um, which will actually compress all of the project files that are required for submission and automatically um, create a zip file that then you could download. This is mostly useful in some of the future projects where like there will be multiple files. So downloading like a collection of files one by one is kind of a hassle, so instead downloading just a zip file, which this script would produce, can be, um, can be, can be good. The one, like, like the, the, a couple important points that I wanna make, uh, and I just demonstrated one thing to be, to be wary of. So on the grading side, there's a couple of considerations before you actually wanna submit uh, some, some of your work for, for grading. And we've highlighted them in the instructions here, so I would pay, pay attention to these. So the first thing is, in order for our grader to, to work as it's expected to, it's important that you don't modify any of the code outside of the cell blocks where we're asking you to modify. So what that means is like, don't add cells to the Jupyter Notebooks and don't modify the code that's running in the Jupyter Notebooks because that can result in no credit for the, for the project. The other thing that's really important um, is, to make sure that you're saving, I, I'll probably go back and add a bullet point here. When you submit a file, make sure that you've saved your notebook before you like download the notebook. It's very tempting to just run cells in the notebook. So you, so you might save your changes to the Python script and then run the corresponding changes in your notebook but not save the notebook. And then that can result in like missing points, at least for me when I was testing my implementation. So one piece of advice is to like make sure you consciously remember to save the notebook as well as the Python before you download it and submit it to the, to the autograder. Um, and then the, the third tip, or like the, yeah, the, the third tip I suppose is, and for project zero this doesn't, this doesn't matter because we're not using the GPUs extensively, but for the projects where we're, start to, where we're starting to train the GPUs, I would very strongly suggest that um, don't leave your Jupyter Notebook open like overnight. So once you're done working on it, you know, close the window 
So like s save your notebook file, but then close the window, you know, and then go to bed or have dinner or whatever, because Google will keep like assuming that you're actually using their resources. So if you like leave the, the Jupyter notebook open, it's saying, hey, we have a K80 GPU that, you know, Anthony keeps using all night. So at some point they'll start to like limit your usage. If you're finding that you're running into usage limits, come and talk to, to me um, uh, and we'll figure out how to resolve that. But from all the testing and past semesters when, when this course has been taught using Jupyter, or Colab, the usage limits haven't been too much of a problem as long as you close your windows once you're done implementing things. Okay, so we've implemented this one feature. Let's say that we want to get some, some feedback. So we're going to download these two files. So you can see um, Google Drive is zipping the two files for us. So Google, Google Drive can be a little bit slow. Okay, so it's zipped them, and let's see, we did it. Wait, it did not download them, though. Okay, tell you what, let's not use the Google Drive code, let's use our code. So to create a zip file of our submission, you can run this, run this cell, so it'll ask for your unique name, you can put that in, it'll ask for your UMID. This is just used, like the, your unique name and UMID is just used here for um, uh, the naming of this particular zip file. So you can see, so it's writing the zip file to our Google Drive within our project folder. So if we come back to our Google Drive, like Google Drive's a little, it's not perfectly in sync, so it might take like 10 to 15 seconds. There you can see it pops up. So if I download this zip file, it will automatically have our submission ready. Now if I come back to my downloads, I can open this, this new folder. So you can see we have the two files that are needed for our submission. We have the notebook file that we're working on and the Python script. We can come back now to the auto grader, right here, and we can re-upload these two files for our second submission. And we should see that we now have one of the features that's required implemented correctly. Take a second to run. All right, so we did. We got one of these was correct. Um, so what you should see once it's correct is you'll see like, yeah, a check mark for you passed, the score on the test case, in this case five out of five, and then all the remaining tests are, will still run and because we didn't change them, will still be empty. Um, but with that, that kind of gets you started. Um, I've kind of skimmed over, like there's quite a bit of text there which should be helpful for orienting you with Python and PyTorch. So I've skipped over that for the sake of time. But uh, if any, but as you work through some of those cells, um, if you have questions, feel free to post it to the forum over the weekend or at office hours next week. We're happy to help. Um, but with that, I think you're all now in a really great position to get started with, with, uh, with Project Zero. Hopefully now you know how to implement the first feature that's requ required. If any, but he has questions, I'll stick around for, for as long as people have questions or if they want me to come around and even if you have Python questions or PyTorch, I'm happy to come around. Um, but we're close to time, so I'll kind of go ahead and uh, start to wrap it up. But thanks for coming to discussion and we'll see you at next Tuesday for lecture on image classification. Thanks.